So, Jose, I want to actually start. I gave you the, the outline of, all right, you're brought here. You got here when you were 12. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and you don't discover for four years that you're undocumented. But tell us a little more about coming, you know, 12 is not... A, a child, right? You're yeah. a, you're a preteen. You already had presumably a Filipino identity. And when when did you feel you were an American? And how did you become an American? And then talk a little bit more about uh, you know what what discovering that you were here in a different status than other Americans. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for having me here. Uh, it's really great to be in Chicago, which is home to a lot of Filipinos. So, any Filipinos <laughs> here, hello. Uh, and just a little tip from me to you, when you see an Asian looking person who has a Spanish name, it means they're Filipino. Uh, it's called Spanish colonialism. Um, so to your, to your point, so I got here when I was 12. Um, you know, my mom basically had packed my suitcase and I woke up one day and she said, you're going to the airport, you're going to America. I, you know, I have to tell you, I, I was supposed to write about my childhood, but I, I guess I was so traumatized by the whole thing, I don't really remember a lot of what had happened. Um, but my, I, I mean, I remember coming to America when I was 12, and this is before the internet, so you couldn't really Google anything. This is 1993. My first introduction to American culture was the O.J. Simpson trial. Wow. <laughs> I remember being in seventh grade, and Mrs. Wakefield stopped the class so we can listen to the verdict. And this is from, this is in the Bay Area, Mountain View, where I grew up. And you were living with your grandparents. I was living with my grandparents, who were naturalized American citizens. Um, and I remember the verdict coming out, and then the white kids reacted differently from the black kids. And then the Latino and the Asian kids just looked at each other going like, what are we supposed to do? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I actually think that kind of crystallizes how a lot of Asians and Latinos who are not part of this black and white dynamic, we're looking at it going like, okay, what, 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 what's <laughs> happening, right? So that was my first introduction to American culture. And for me, America in the beginning was Toni Morrison. Huh. I read The Blue Eyes when I was in eighth grade. Yeah. America was the Golden Girls. Um, America was Charlie Rose, it was Dr. Dre. Um, America was James Baldwin. That was the big thing. And then I found out, as you said, that I was here illegally when I went to the DMV. And I have to tell you, if I hadn't been introduced to James Baldwin as early as I, I had, I don't think I would have had the right kind of frame of mind or even the language to, to talk about myself. <laughs> I don't yeah. know if you, I can, I can explain a little bit about that. Like, you know, this idea of pledging allegiance to a flag that doesn't, really want to pledge back to you. <laughs> this idea of, you know, when I was growing up, the media called us illegals, right? Like people talk about us like we're like insects off people's backs. Um, my first instinct when I found out that I was here illegally was, I have to talk like this, right? So thank, thank God for Charlie Rose and television and for Dr. Dre, because I figured I had to talk white and black. Uh -huh so that you could never, whatever that's supposed to mean, so that you could never, so you, so you would never ask me if I'm from here, right? Like the most dangerous question for me when I was growing up was where are you from? Right. But, right. but you spoke Tagalog when you got here and then learned English and then? Yeah, I, 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 speak, I spoke English in the Philippines, but I, you know, I was with a very thick Filipino accent like this. <laughs> um, <laughs> And but slang. you lost that accent. But I lost, because I figured if I kept that accent, then I wouldn't be quote unquote American. I had to lose it, right? I had to speak perfect English. I had to write perfect American sentences and learn how to use a semicolon versus a comma versus a <laughs> M dash. <laughs> so these were the things that I thought I needed to do to pass. I don't know if that makes sense. To kind of so that I'm not gonna be the illegal in people's heads. And mind you, around the same time that I found that I was here illegally, I also found out, I realized that I was gay because of AOL chat rooms. Do you know what AOL chat rooms are? <laughs> uh, so that's how I figured that out. That's when I found that I was gay. <laughs> and it was too much to be in the closet about two things at once. So I figured I had to get out of one of them. Uh, and you know what happened? Ellen DeGeneres happened. Yeah. I mean, I remember I remember Ellen DeGeneres on the cover of Time Magazine when I was in sophomore in high school. And I remember it was the first magazine 
I ever bought, American magazine I ever bought. And I remember hiding it in the closet in my bedroom because I didn't want my grandparents to see it. <laughs> Which is ironic. Um, and so when I, when I came out for the second time, five and a half years ago, and I'm totally done coming out, uh, <laughs> that the whole idea of, if, if you think about the shift in how we think about LGBTQ people in this country, exactly. right? Um, the cultural shift that started with Ellen DeGeneres, I would argue started with Harvey Milk, argue with Frank Kameny in the 50s, right? That cultural shift created the space for political shift to happen. And I actually wanted to show you this video from Define American that we did. Yes, please. The video is all about, and we're in Chicago, so we have to really honor the fact that the coming out of undocumented people started in Chicago. Um, I don't know if you remember young people in downtown Chicago in front, of the, in front of the mayor's office declaring themselves undocumented and unafraid. This was as early as 2006. And then uploading the videos on YouTube. Wow. <laughs> Can you imagine yep. like the very people that you're supposed to detain and deport are outing themselves, declaring themselves here illegally, and daring the government to say, what do you want to do with me? So because of that, Define American was inspired to really connect the dots between immigrant rights and LGBT rights, and what it means to come out. So that's what this video Great. is about. I'm coming out to show that we are your neighbors, your coworkers, your classmates, and your friends. I'm coming out because I refuse to stand on the sidelines while others accomplish change. I am coming now for my son so that we can be safe and together. I'm coming out now because the person that is me cannot be defined by a piece of paper. We must destroy the myths once and for all, shatter them. You must tell your friends if indeed they are your friends. You must tell your neighbors. You must tell the people you work with. You must tell the people in the stores you shop in. We must continue to speak out. And most importantly, we must come out. Coming out takes many forms, but it always requires courage. It's time. It's time for all of us. Employers, employees, teachers, students, families, neighbors, Americans, allies, to overcome shame, to overcome fear, to document and define ourselves. We are coming out to be seen for who we are, not only as undocumented immigrants, but as Americans. Come out. Join us. at defineamerican.com. Um, I love it. Oh, I love it. Um, uh, love it. So, okay. just, so just some context about this video. The voice that you hear in the middle is Harvey Milk. That's his voice telling people to come out. This was filmed in the city hall of San Francisco where you know, Gavin Newsom, the mayor, started marrying same-sex couples in 2003. So we really need to kind of to make that connection. I don't know if you notice, um, you saw undocumented black people. There are about 600,000 undocumented black immigrants in this country. You saw undocumented white people. Why don't we ever talk about undocumented Canadians and French and German people? Uh, you saw undocumented Asian people, undocumented Filipinos, Thai. Um, actually, the fastest growing undocumented population in this country are Asians, not Latinos, no matter what Donald Trump tells you about that wall. Um, this represents really the humanity of this issue, which is for the most part has gotten lost in the way we in the media and the politicians have overly politicized it. As you're watching it, I hope you were thinking of the what? 550,000 undocumented people in the state of Illinois, right? About 5% of the workers in the state are undocumented. In the city of Chicago alone, about 50% of the Chicago metro area's population growth have come from immigrants in the past 10 years, and many of them, some of them are undocumented. So for us, this is about telling the full story of this issue. And mind you, we didn't call it Define Immigrant. We called it Define American. American. So that's exactly the question I want to ask you, because the thing you've done spectacularly 
is to say these are not illegal aliens, because that's really, uh, you know, as a lawyer, that's the term, yes. aliens, yes. right? Illegal aliens, like from Mars or something. <laughs> uh, and you're saying, whoa, 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 these are human beings. These are your friends, your neighbors, these are human beings, and you use the term undocumented immigrants. And in a nation of, of immigrants where, other than Native Americans, everyone else came to this country, you're saying these are immigrants like everybody else, but they're undocumented. So humanizing them, absolutely. But let's talk about what it means to be an American yeah. in the legal sense, right? Yes. Because this, you can be completely supportive of what you're doing, but you can also say, well, wait a minute, we can't just throw open oh. the borders. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, there are then people who say, well, wait a minute, you know, I came legally, I'm documented. There is a difference oh, yeah. in the law. So how do you, how do you respond? This is why I can't be the first person to oh, ask no. you this question. I mean, question. I go on Fox News at least once a week. <laughs> um, it is really, really important. I think especially now, whatever happens on November 8th, I think we all know that we cannot afford to talk in our, within our silos anymore. We cannot afford to just have conversations with people who agree with us, right? I, I make sure that I'm making myself as uncomfortable as possible whenever I can. Oh, it's a great so I life speak philosophy. to as many Tea Party Republican conservative people who seem to think that I should be deported like tomorrow, right? So I'm glad you asked that question. And my answer to that question is absolutely I want to do it quote unquote the right way, right? Like, I mean, I find it really interesting that do people think we want to come here so we can get exploited and be called criminals? <laughs> I actually think what gets lost in this, this entire conversation about immigration is why do people move, right? Um, by the way, like part of our job at Define American is really unpacking some of these myths, right? So when we say that, Im that unless you're a Native American, you're an immigrant to this country, we have actually left out black people in that equation. That's forced migration. Yes. They were imported. Right? I mean, and we, ha we have to be honest about the fact that this country is addicted to cheap labor. Right? I mean, come on. You put a sign on us at the U.S.-Mexico border that says, keep out, 10 yards in, what do you say? Help wanted. Right? We can't all babysit your kids and mow your lawns and serve your drinks. Or is that what you want us to do? Right? The fact of the matter is you need the labor. Right? About 25% of farmers in this country are undocumented. So when people say, oh, what does immigration have to do with me? I'm sorry, when was the last time you had a burger and a salad? Yeah. Right? And, and to me, as somebody who's Filipino, um, <laughs> there, I was in North Carolina a few months ago, and I did this event. Actually, it was a conservative event. And the man afterwards, because I said that there are about 4 million Filipinos in the United States. 4 million, right? We're the, second, we're the third largest immigrant group. Wow. Yeah, wow. it's uh, Mexicans, Chinese, and Filipinos. And this man said, well, why are there so many of you here? And he didn't say that the nice way. And, and all I could say to him was, you know, sir, we are here because you were there. Yes. That's why we're here. Remember the Spanish-American War? Like, what gets so lost in the conversation is, what does U.S. foreign policy and U.S. trade agreements have to do with migration patterns? When all those kids from Central America started walking for their lives, from El Salvador, from Guatemala, from Honduras, what did we do to those countries? And why are they coming here? We're not even talking about that at all. And why is it that when white people move, it's called manifest destiny, right? <laughs> it's white man's burden. <laughs> why is it that when people like me move, it's a question of legality and criminality, right? I find it really, really interesting. I, I, I believe that a country has a right to define and defend its borders, absolutely. But why does my iPhone have more migrant rights than I do as a human being? This can be manufactured in China, delivered to Cupertino, and get to New York where I bought it, right? There's 244 million migrants in the world. We don't know how many of them are undocumented or unauthorized. We don't know how many of them, that, that's the largest percentage ever. People are moving, and you know what's really interesting? They are moving to countries that previously colonized or imperialized them. Yes. The jig is up. If you can come to our countries, why can't we come to yours? So, Define American, the, this organization that you've, you've founded, is about 
changing immigration policy, having an open and honest more, conversation. More conversation than policy. More conversation. Absolutely. But at the same time, I think we need to be resolving these issues now. And they are labor issues, and they are uh, their race issues, yeah. they're also their discrimination issues. But from a longer term perspective, yes. you know, by, uh, the Eric Liu has this, uh, wrote this article about um, what does it mean to be an American. Uh, and he wrote, he said, being an American is slowly, agonizingly, but inexorably being decoupled from being white. So in 2050, when you say an American in the world, that will not mean a white person. It could mean a white person, but it's equally or it's more likely to mean a person of color. There will be many yeah. different groups of color, but think about that. You know, from the beginning of this country, the dominant group was the white group. So being an American meant being white, and if you weren't white, you were something else. You were a hyphenated American. Yes. But that's gonna change. And so you also have this, um, this wonderful uh, uh, venture called Emerging Us. Yes. But I hear that as, emerging U.S., that we are becoming a very different country. So I wanted to so, ask you about that. I mean, to be perfectly frank about this, so the country is only going to get gayer. <laughs> so we're only going to get gayer, blacker, browner, more Asian. Women, white women, black women, Latinas, Muslim women, all women will continue to break all barriers that must be broken. So what's left? <laughs> How much change can straight white men handle? <laughs> and to all the straight white guys in the room, please don't get nervous. Like, <laughs> we are going to have to do something that we in the country don't really know how to do, which is how to have more honest, uncomfortable conversations with each other, right? I mean, it's fascinating for me when I travel around the country talking about immigration and define American, the conversations always ended up ending about race, yeah. about the fact that Race meaning, why don't they play football? Why are they playing soccer? Race like, why don't they like our food? What are they cooking, right? Milk I mean, I remember they. having they. And you know, back to your point, which is absolutely right. When did do, when do Italians and Irish and Germans, when did they become white? <laughs> About 1900. <laughs> <laughs> and when, when you get into whiteness, what is that against, yep. right? And let, to me, this is a really, really important statistic. 88% of the total population growth in America in the next 50 years are going to come from mostly Latinos and Asians. 88%. So remember that, the, the episode in the O.J. Simpson verdict? So, that hit, so where Asians and Latinos fit into this dynamic in the era of Black Lives Matter, in the era when white people are an emerging racial minority, which is really the reality in Chicago, that's a big conversation. Right? And that means facing the intersections of race, immigration, and what it means for American identity. And I actually think this year has been in many ways the quintessential Define American election. And I think this year we have to really ask ourselves, you know, who are we? And who are we becoming? And personally for me, I have to say, you know, I haven't seen my mother for 23 years. Um, that's what immigration, that's what this means. So I left when I was 12. Um, I can't leave because if I leave, they won't let me back, especially probably under President Trump. Um, my mom is on a 16-year waiting list to come, which is typical for, for the Philippines or India. Uh, she can't even get a tourist visa because she doesn't own property. She's not a college graduate. Now, mind you, if she were like a French woman and she wanted to go see Hamilton over the weekend, if she yeah. could get tickets, um, she could go. Yeah. Right? Now, what this race and class have to do with that, right? So for me, like, I don't, <laughs> I don't really need a piece of paper to tell me I'm, Amer I'm an American. My middle school teachers, my high school teachers, my journalism mentors already have told me that. So what we're talking about here are way more than pieces of papers and laws, you know? Of course I respect the law. I would not have risked my life and come out if I didn't. But we as a country, we're as much a nation of justice as we are a nation of laws, especially considering how there was a time in this country when women you know, weren't allowed to vote. Absolutely. When black people were relegated. Did you know that in this country, it wasn't until 1924 that we gave Native, Native American citizenship rights? It wasn't until 1924 that we gave Native American citizenship rights. 
Native. Native Americans. Americans. I just have to say, by the way, um, if you're an American citizen, can you raise your hand? I sincerely hope you don't take that for granted. People like me are fighting for something that you have that sometimes just fall in your laps. I would actually argue that undocumented people in this, in this country, including the 550 undocumented people in this state, I actually think we show Americans what it is to be an American. Because it's a fight. It's not something that just lands in your lap. It's something that you actually have to earn. So, Jose, we are a much stronger, richer America because you're an American. Thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs>